This is my reading of an essay I wrote about the recent novel There There by Tommy Orange. When it comes to the Western view of the history of Native American Indians, there are two extremes. Either they are noble savages, untouched by the original sin of industrial civilization, or they are unsophisticated barbarians who are antithetical to the invisible hand of progress. But do either of those reflect the true Native American Indian experience in modern times? After all, most Native American Indians have integrated into society. There There, published in 2018, is the debut novel of Tommy Orange, and, ex and it explores that very question. Mr. Orange is well positioned to write such a book. When interviewed by the American Booksellers Association, he explained the reason for his book. Quote, Being native, to me, was my dad going back to Oklahoma to visit family and his, and his language because he's fluent in Cheyenne, Cheyenne, I'm probably mispronouncing that. But then, but then I spent a bunch of years in the urban Indian community working in mental health, doing a storytelling project, and realizing just how many stories there were that people should hear, especially other urban natives, to see their own stories reflected in a bigger way. We're pretty invisible native people in movies and TV shows and literature, so I was feeling like I wanted to t try to tell a story that hadn't been told about a community that people know too little about." Unquote. Most events in the story take place in Mr. Orange's hometown, Oakland, California. One might say this novel is a quintessentially postmodern text. Some chapters are told from the first person, others chap other chapters are told from the third person, and one is told from the second person perspective. There is Tony Loneman, a 21-year-old who suffers from fetal alcohol syndrome who lives, who lives with his grandmother and earns money however he can. Octav Octavio uh, Gormez, a drug dealer, and his partner in crime, pun intended, Charles. Daniel Gonzalez is Octavio's cousin who likes to fiddle with his drone. And Calvin Johnson is Charles's brother. He owes Charles drug money. There's Edwin Black biracial young man and a student of literature who gets an internship at the local Indian Cultural Center and who helps set up the Oakland powwow. Bob Davis, a janitor of the Oakland Coliseum who is dating Edwin's mother. We meet Jackie Redfeather, a substance abuse counselor, and her sister Opal Viola Victoria Bearshield, a postwoman. Blue is Jackie's first daughter but was given up for adoption and never knew her mother. Opal takes care of Jackie's grandsons, Orville Redfeather, Loney, and Luther, uh, the children of Jackie's second daughter who committed suicide. Orville cannot help but be fascinated by his heritage and enrolls as a, as a dancer for the upcoming powwow. And then there's Dean Oxidane, another young man who is attempting to make a documentary film about the Native American Indian experience. Dean's project is partly based on a project Orange attempted, and it can also be said that the entire book is a mirror image of Dean's film. There are a few minor characters, such as, such as Edwin's white mother Karen and Carlos, a friend of Charles. Many of these characters are connected in some way. Edwin and Blue share the same father, a man called Harvey. Calvin works at the Indian Cultural Center. The in Indian Cultural Center is how Dean is getting the funding for his documentary. Bill Davis almost catches Daniel's drone while it fi fr flies around in the Coliseum, the very co Coliseum which hosts the powwow. The reader can tell that the world of Native American Indians is small. But the most important way these characters are, conne are connected is they all end up at the powwow. A humorous and ironic aspect of that is Blue and Edwin both meet their long-lost parent, although Blue doesn't announce to Jackie that she's her daughter. And it is unfortunately not at a powwow that these characters could 
ever, or will ever, forget. Octavio, Charles, Carlos, and Tony all decide to rob the powwow for the grand prize, a bag full of gift cards. When Tony decides at the last minute to back out of the deal and Octavio takes matters into his own hands, gunfire ensues. Many innocent people are wounded in the process, including Edwin, Orville, and Bill. Orville and Edwin are taken to the hospital. Tony goes after the others, and the novel ends with Charles dead, and Tony, Carlos, and Octavio lying on the Colosseum, bleeding to death. As if Mr. Orange feels like the stories of these 12 characters aren't enough, this finishes the early obs observation about this novel being postmodern. There is one essay titled Prologue before Part 1, and one essay titled Interlude in the middle of Part 2. Whether he meant to or not, the author puts his voice into the story directly with these two essays. Neither feels out of place, however. The richness of the book comes from the various perspectives the reader is offered, including the author's. The whole book could be summarized by a paragraph from the prologue. Quote, In 1621, colonists invite Mazazoet, the chief of the Wampa Wampanoags, to a feast after a recent land deal. Mazazoet came with 90 of his men. That meal is why we still eat a meal together in November, celebrated as a nation. But that wasn't a Thanksgiving meal. It was a land deal meal. Two years later, there was another, similar meal meant to symbolize, et meant to symbolize eternal friendship. Two hundred Indians dropped dead that night from an unknown poison. Or this quote from the interlude, which is just as powerful and prescient. The wound that was made when white people came and took all that they took has never healed. An unintended wound gets infected becomes a new kind of wound, like the history of what actually happened became a new kind of history. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time, that we haven't been listening to, are just part of what we need to heal. Not that we're broken, and don't make the, miser the mistake of calling us resilient. To not have been destroyed, to not have been given up, to, not have, s to have survived is no badge of honor. Would you call an attempted murder victim resilient? My ancestry is European, so at the risk of playing identity politics, it's hard to know what fresh arguments I can bring since I have no claim to the history that Mr. Orange and many others have a claim to. One wonders if the issue is cultural. To put it another way, does the average American of European ancestry share a common language with Native American Indians? Is there something about American culture which makes, which makes this part of our history such a blur to us? What I mean is that the United States is the greatest Pollyanna among the nations of the world. Why else did the famous Nietzsche scholar Walter Kaufman declare American tragedy impossible? To be American is to focus on so-called success and minimize so-called failure. To be American is to constantly look at the future as man's chance for salvation. There, there is much more like Flaubert's Madame Bovary than Disney's Pocahontas. Because of this, and, such, and despite the fact that media outlets like the New York Times and National Public Radio have lauded the book and its author, it might not be a bestseller. This would, wouldn't in any way diminish Mr. Orange's achievement, of course. To tie all this back to the rather grisly ending, the Native American Indian community has been dehumanized for so long, and to be part of a people that has faced genocide and discrimination, then, means that the system your ancestors did or did not integrate into views your life as somehow cheap, expendable. Orange, by the way, is explicit that this book is about urban natives. And when the world around you views your life cheaply, you too start to view your life cheaply. You live on the edge, take risks, and get desperate. This is not to excuse gun violence or to view Native American Indians as hopeless victims. 
but it's about time that the United States takes a look at its bloody history and acknowledges the inherent worth of the people who lived in this land before Europeans arrived. This goes beyond changing the name of the Washington Redskins to something else because it's racist, which I couldn't care less about, frankly. What I do care about, though, is creating a meritocracy, and when a country doesn't confront its history, it will continue to suffer from the unnatural inequality which has plagued us for centuries. It is not utopian to want to diminish such inequality, and if the nation-state is to exist, then perhaps it is time that the government gives money to these communities and betters the conditions of the reservations on which some of them live. A common argument against this reasoning brings up the fact that it is impossible to erase the crimes of our ancestors. They are quite right. Is it wrong, nevertheless, to accept that most of us are the beneficiaries of past atrocities? When Thomas Jefferson meditated on the role of slavery in his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, was he being overly dra dramatic when he said, Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Whatever Thomas Jefferson's intentions when he wrote that, I interpret God in that context in the same way Immanuel Kant interpreted God. God is conscience. Jefferson was brooding about posterity. He realized the moral bankruptcy of slavery, and he fretted over the struggles subsequent generations would have to go through in order to, get, in order to right a wrong. He also realized that man's capacity to alter the world for the better is immense. We should use the history of Native American Indians as a spur to greater things. If we can better the lives of those living, then when Judgment Day arrives, at, we, at least we can face the heavenly tribunal and quote the South African theologian Desmond Tutu, Do your little bit of good where you are. It is those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Thank you.